Jesus and the three disciples, Peter and James and John, have just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And now in the valley below them, they discover that the other disciples are in a dispute with the scribes of the Pharisees over the attempted casting out of a demon from a demon-possessed boy. Welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana. I'm glad that you're worshiping with us this day. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we study the scriptures together today, we pray that your Holy Spirit, who inspired Mark to write these words down, would be our guide and our teacher that he would help us with a full understanding of what the scriptures have to say and how such things apply in our lives this day as believers in Christ. We ask all of this through Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Hear the word of God. I am reading today from Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14 down through verse 29. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Amen. This is God's holy and inspired word. May he add his richest blessings to our reading and hearing and understanding of it today. You will recall that when Moses was on top of Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord, the Israelites at the base of the mountain were engaging in sin. They had created an idol and they were worshiping that idol as if it were the true and the living God. And they were doing other things that were sinful there. Jesus and his disciples have also been with Moses and with Elijah on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. And now they have come down from the mountain and similarly Jesus and Peter and James and John discover that the other disciples are engaged in a dispute with the scribes and that there is sin indeed there in the valley below the mountain. What has happened is these uh, disciples had been asked to do something and hadn't been unable to do so. Uh, there is a great multitude that gathers as Jesus returns from the top of the mountain. They see him, they recognize him, they are amazed that he's there, they run to him, and so a crowd begins to gather. And among this multitude that is there, we find obviously some who do believe in him. We're going to see one man in particular in just a moment. But also we find the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are the scribes who are there disputing with the disciples. 
These scribes most likely once again were an official delegation sent out from Jerusalem in order to do a, a what we would call a fact-finding mission uh, about Jesus and about his disciples. Now, there's not really a lot of fact-finding going on here. There's a great deal of finger-pointing and a, a great deal of animosity. And so they are disputing with the disciples, Mark says. That word disputing does not mean they were arguing in order to try to find answers. It means that they were arguing for the sake of arguing. These scribes often had a, an ulterior motive, and that ulterior motive was to trick and to trap Jesus or his disciples, find them engaged in something that they could claim was sin, and therefore do away with them. And so this mob there, the, the crowd that's there, contains a mob, a mob of people who are, well, today let's call them cancel culture. They are out to destroy Jesus and his followers. They're looking for uh, ways to do that. They're not interested in actually having a serious debate or argument, just as people in cancel culture are not interested today. They want simply to uh, find some reason to uh, justify their hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples and try to do away with them. And so they are arguing with the disciples, not for the purpose of gaining answers, but simply for tricking and trapping them. Uh, this argument probably revolves around the authority that the disciples had to cast out demons. Now, the point's moot because no demon has been cast out, or it could very well be that what the, the scribes are doing is they're saying, you claim to be able to cast out demons, but here you cannot do so. Where does your authority come from after all? And so they may be trying to destroy the disciples over a promise that they cannot deliver on. Whatever the case happens to be, they've gathered, they're arguing with the disciples. Jesus comes and he asks the scribes, what are you discussing? But before the scribes can answer, a man from the crowd does. This man says to Jesus, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples, I asked your disciples to cast this demon out, but they could not. Now, this is a desperate father of a young boy. This is the father of a young man who has been demon-possessed for a long time. And he comes uh, to explain this to Jesus. Uh, this demon has caused deafness and muteness and seizures in this boy's life. And he explains that the demon often throws the boy down and he uh, rolls around, he foams at the mouth, uh, he gnashes his teeth and then he becomes rigid. And he had asked for deliverance. He had come to the disciples looking for Jesus. Jesus was on the mountaintop. He asked the disciples to cast the demon out and they were unable to do so. Now, modern unbelievers look at this passage and what they think is, uh, these folks from a long time ago who did not understand the advances of modern medicine today mistook an epileptic seizure for demon possession. Uh, that's the, the tack that they usually uh, take on uh, something like this, is they only see this through modern medicine, and therefore they assume that this is an epileptic seizure. That does sound like one. Uh, when I was in college, I had two friends who had epilepsy. Uh, one of the young men had uh, petty mal seizures, and the other one had grand mal seizures. The petty mal seizures uh, were very, very slight. Uh, this uh, fellow uh, would be talking with you, and suddenly he would go rigid. He would still remain standing. He wouldn't fall down. He wouldn't begin foaming at the mouth, but he would just become inert. And after a certain period of time had passed, he would uh, start talking once again and sometimes would not even realize that he had been frozen in place for a while. That's, that's the petty mal seizure. But my next door neighbor in the dormitory had grand mal seizures. Uh, I found out about that uh, when I was visiting him one day in his uh, uh, room and all of a sudden he fell off the bed onto the floor, began to shake violently, uh, grind his teeth, and uh, he was having a, 
a grand mal uh, epileptic seizure. I had never experienced that before. It terrified me, and I learned something from what to do uh, about that after talking with him when he recovered from it. But it is a scary thing, and so this does sound, in light of modern medicine, it sounds like an epileptic seizure. However, notice that the Bible clearly indicates that Jesus deals with this as a, an instance of demon possession, indicating to us that sometimes in Scripture, either demons are able to trigger some type of physical affliction, and in this case, something like epilepsy, or that the mere demon possession of this young man caused him to be both deaf and mute, as well as have seizures that resemble epilepsy. Uh, whatever the case happens to be, he certainly is truly demon-possessed, for Jesus takes this seriously and deals with this as an aspect of demon possession as he heals this young man. But before he does that, he addresses his own disciples and calls them a faithless generation. And in what appears to be frustration said, how long am I going to be with you? How long am I going to have to put up with you? Uh, bring this young man to me. And so uh, he is very frustrated at his uh, disciples. He's not rebuking the scribes. He's not rebuking the crowd so much. Uh, they don't really know him or, or know his power. Uh, he is rebuking the ones who should know the power that he has, who should have faith in him, and yet are not showing evidence of such faith. He is rebuking his own disciples. He likens them to the faithless generation among which they live. In other words, what he is saying to his disciples is, you ought to have more faith than this crowd around you. You ought to be distinguished from those who have no faith whatsoever, and yet you are indistinguishable from them. You are exactly like them in this. Uh, you should have been able to perform this miracle. You should have been able to cast out this demon. You should have done this by turning to God through prayer, and yet you have been unable to do so. And so their failure, as we go through this passage, stems from the fact that they lack faith in God, which they should have had because of their intimate ties to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, they, probably the father as well as perhaps other family members, bring the boy to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the boy comes into Jesus' presence, suddenly when the demon sees Christ, uh, he seizes the boy, he throws him into a convulsion, throws him to the ground, he rolls around on the ground and uh, begins to uh, foam at the mouth. And so this is obviously the demon uh, controlling this young man's uh, ability to, to move, to act, to speak, to hear, anything whatsoever. And so Jesus turns to the boy's father and says, how long has he been like this? And the father's reply is, ever since he was tiny, ever since he was little, ever since he was a child, this has happened to him. And this demon has seized him from time to time and has tried to kill him. The demon has attempted to throw him into the fire to, uh, to burn him up or into the water to drown him. And uh, he, is, he has been like this for so long. Now, what we see from this is that the demon's motivation apparently was to inflict as much physical pain on the one that he possessed as he possibly could with the final intent, ultimately, of killing this boy. And so this was the demon's desire, apparently. This is what the demon had been doing for some time. And uh, we see this in the repeated episodes from early childhood that have happened to this young man. Listen to this desperate father's plea. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. This 
father of this young boy has been dealing with this problem for years and years. Perhaps he's tried various cures and nothing has worked, obviously. There's no solution to the demon possession that has taken hold of his son. Uh, he may have spent his money on attempted cures and nothing has happened. And now finally, he hears that Jesus has come to his region. And he's filled with hope once again, but it's a desperate hope. Uh, he has settled on finally going to Jesus and asking Jesus for help, only to find when he gets there that Jesus is not among his disciples. And so in desperation, uh, in near despair, the Father has asked the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ to cast this demon out of his son. And apparently they tried and were unable to do so. And so this man is at his wit's end when he says, if you can do anything, please have compassion. Please help us. Now, he has had his hopes lifted when he came to the disciples, only to have those hopes smashed when they could not do what he asked. Jesus' reply is uh, to focus on the one thing that seems to be wavering at this particular moment in this man's life. His faith. His faith is wavering, certainly. It's not gone entirely. He has come to the right source. He's come to the right place for help. Uh, help has not been forthcoming yet. And so this man is full of both faith and doubt at the same time. He knows, he believes that Jesus can help. But so far, nothing has helped. And Jesus' disciples couldn't help. And so he cries out for help, hoping that something can indeed be done. And so Jesus focuses on this man's small but, and, and wavering faith, but it's genuine faith. And he tells him, all things are possible for the one who believes. Now, do not rip this verse out of Scripture and print it on a bumper sticker or on a t-shirt and make it your mantra as though... Uh, this was a universal statement of all, kind, all times for all certain situations. Don't take it out of context. Don't assume, as many people unfortunately do, that God is somehow obligated to do something for you just because you wish for it or want it to happen hard enough. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not telling this uh, father... Just hang on and want it enough and it'll happen. He's not saying that. He is certainly not saying that. Years ago, I had a, a terrible experience. And the experience was, as a pastor of a, a church, we had a, a woman who was the wife of one of our elders who had cancer. She was in intensive care. She was dying and eventually did die uh, in the intensive care unit. But right next to where she was, there was a family gathered, and the mother in that family also was dying of cancer. However, this family belonged to one of these name it and claim it churches, and the pastor of that church had come, and the mother of uh, several little ones uh, was the one who was sick, and so all these small children were gathered together in the intensive care with uh, the father, and this pastor said, I've asked God and I've claimed the promises of Jesus and God is going to heal your mama, so take some crayons and go home and make a banner saying, Welcome home, mama. She died. I was also there uh, later on when that pastor came back by. The family has just heard the news that this woman has died and this man said to these children, you did not believe hard enough. The implication was, your mother is dead because you lacked faith. That is not what Jesus is saying here. That is a perversion of what Jesus is saying here. And so what we have here is a situation in which our Lord gives us a great promise, and that is that God is able to do all sorts of things. All things are possible for those who believe, not in a 
contentless faith, but in Him, in Jesus Christ, who trust in Him. And yet, and so God does answer prayers just exactly like uh, the prayer of this, this man uh, who had been praying, obviously. But sometimes God's answer to prayer is no. Sometimes He does exactly what we ask for. And that's what Jesus is talking about. But think of the Apostle Paul. Paul who was able to raise the dead. Paul who uh, healed many folks. Paul who had a thorn in the flesh and cried out to God in prayer three times to have that thorn in the flesh removed and was told, no. The answer that God gave Paul was, my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, Paul's weakness enabled God to work through him to a greater extent. And so Paul says, I'll rejoice in weakness because then I'm strong, strong in Christ. And so the thing to recognize is that God sometimes when we pray for some type of healing or some type of deliverance or whatever it happens to be, God sometimes says no and in the no He provides an even greater solution, but not deliverance from that problem. But Jesus, at this particular point, is telling this man that astonishing answers to prayer can be sought and can be found from God through faith in Him, in Jesus Christ. The Father gets the answer and it terrifies Him. Immediately, he says through his tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And so what's happening here is he's expressing his faith in Jesus Christ. He's expressing his faith in God. But at the same time, he's crying out in his tears that unbelief still continues within his heart. He knows his faith is weak. And therefore, He fears that his weak faith may doom his son to a life of demon possession. And so he asks Jesus, help turn my unbelief into faith that I might be able to see the answer to this promise that you've given. He is struggling with doubts. He is struggling with fears. Why? Because so often he has been disappointed in the past. He's been disappointed recently when he went to the disciples and they could not cast this demon out. And so he believes Jesus can help his son. He clings to that hope with what faith he has. And he asks Jesus, please do not allow this small faith that's mixed with unbelief, that's mixed with doubt and fear to prevent my son being healed. That's what he's crying out. He's exhibiting the human heart as it is, even for believers. We trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet we often are confronted with fears and with doubts because we're worried that our faith is not strong enough. Forgetting that what Jesus reminds us of is if we have faith as small as a grain of mustard, a mustard seed, such faith can move mountains. And so Jesus has given hope to this man. The man is fearful that his faith doesn't measure up. And therefore he cries out, help my unbelief, turn my unbelief into faith. Please don't cause me in my lack of belief to damage my son any further. While all this is going on, a larger and larger crowd begins to gather. People begin to run uh, to where Jesus is talking with this uh, father. And uh, Jesus sees the crowd beginning to grow. And he turns and he immediately casts the demon out. He speaks to the deaf and dumb spirit. It says, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Get out and don't come back. That's what Jesus is saying to this unclean spirit. And what happens, of course, is the demon cries out in terror. 
The demon is forced because Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of sinners. He is the second person of the Holy Trinity. He is God incarnate. The demon cannot resist what Jesus has said, and the demon flees. But in fleeing, he convulses this boy one last time before he departs. There's no contest ever in Scripture between demons and Christ or demons and God. That's Hollywood. Hollywood will make you think that demons and God are on the same level. That demons are as powerful as God or as powerful as Jesus and uh, certainly more powerful than Christians. And so we encounter, as I've mentioned before, uh, the idea that Hollywood gives us that we have to out-devil the devil, that we have to outsmart him, that we have to figure out some way to trick him to do what we want him to do. And, and it happens because of human wisdom, or it happens because we know the right magic spell, or exactly the right words to say, or, or whatever. Uh, we never find that in Scripture. There is never any contest between Jesus and the devil or the forces of darkness at all. It's no contest. The demon has to flee. He is merely a fallen creature. This demon must do as Christ commands. And so as he flees, he convulses this boy one last time, convulses him greatly as he, this demon departs. And now Mark records the reaction of the crowd. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. Now that's the obvious response. They think he's dead. There's, uh, it appears that the demon has killed this young man. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose, it says. Now, the wording that's used here can be interpreted in one of two ways. Either this boy actually is dead and Jesus raises him back to life. Or he merely appears to be dead, and Jesus raises him back upon his feet once again. Uh, the, as I said, the wording can mean either thing. It's not impossible to hold either interpretation and be biblical about it. There's no firm answer uh, given to us in Scripture at this place as to whether or not this boy died and Jesus raised him back to life or whether he was uh, in such a condition that he looked like he was dead and Jesus raised him back on his feet again. However, I'll give you my personal opinion. Please understand, this is my opinion. I think the boy died and Jesus raised him to life once again. And the reason I do that is because what Jesus did was he took the boy by the hand and then he lifted him up, it said. That word lifted him up can also be translated uh, not only to rise, uh, raise him back up on his feet, but also to raise a person from the dead. The uh, word literally can mean either of those things. And it says the boy arose, which could be he stood up, or it could be he came back to life from the dead. That word also means that thing. And since both of these words are used uh, of Jesus' resurrection from the dead later on, uh, it seems to me that Mark is probably telling us that Jesus raised this boy back from the dead and that the boy arose from the dead. But in either case, whether he was merely passed out, appeared to be dead, and Jesus uh, lifted him back onto his feet again, or whether he, he was actually dead and Jesus brought him back to life again, notice that what takes place is Jesus has thoroughly healed this young man, either from death uh, or just from fainting at this point, but also from the deafness and the muteness and especially from the demon possession. The boy is alive. The boy is free from demon possession and will never be demon possessed again. The boy is able to hear and he's able to speak. And now uh, Jesus' disciples go with him into a house and then privately away from the crowd, they ask Jesus, why couldn't we do this? What was wrong with what we attempted to do? Why did we fail 
when you succeeded. And Jesus answers them, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. It can only come out by prayer and fasting. Now, that's an indication to us that certainly in Scripture, some demon-possessed people are harder to heal than others. And this boy was one of them. But it's also a reminder to the disciples that they have failed in one key area. They failed to pray. They failed to pray. You would think that disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ would know that they needed to pray. But let's never forget that these men are sinners just as we are. And that often we sinners think that we can certainly perform some spiritual act in the power of our own flesh. And we never can. Now, don't forget, these men, these disciples, had been sent out already on a preaching mission in which they were given the authority from the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and to cast out demons. And they had all done so. And so they're surprised and they're upset that they are unable to handle this one instance here. Perhaps the reason that they failed is because they presumed that since they had done this before, it lay within their own power to be able to do this again. And so while you and I don't cast out demons, may never encounter demon possession, what we can take away from this, what we can understand from this, is the lesson that even if you or I have been successful in the past in some spiritual activity, that is not something that you or I can ever rely upon as though it resides within ourselves or within our own power to be able to do this again, even if we've done it once before. We are taught by the Lord Jesus Christ what His disciples needed to learn, and that is we are always at all times to rely upon God through faith in Christ and prayer. And prayer. If we do not pray, then we are relying upon ourselves. We're relying upon the arm of the flesh. We are attempting to do something that can only be done by faith in Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit and in answer to prayer. And when we think that we can do it, we can go it alone, we've done it in the past, it's bound to work again this time, we fall into the same category as the disciples here. You and I must constantly seek God's help through prayer. Prayer in Christ, prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit, but prayer, not any reliance upon ourselves whatsoever. All the help that we need comes from without. It comes from God. It does not reside within. And so they needed to be taught to pray and not simply to presume. And you also must learn to pray and not be taught to presume. Now obviously, this answer that's given here is only for Christians. Because if you are listening to this audio or watching this video today, and you are apart from Christ, you have no promise that God will hear or answer your prayer. He does that for those who trust in Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so, if you are apart from Christ, you must come to Christ. You must turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ now, before it is too late. And then you will discover that there are answers to prayer. But do not ever presume and uh, make no mistake about it. God will not hear and will not answer the prayers of those who are apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless the one prayer they're praying is to cry out in repentance and ask God to forgive them through Christ. And that's a prayer of faith. And so... 
if you have no faith in Jesus, you have no way to pray, you have no desire to pray, and you have no promise of any answer of prayer. Put your faith in Christ now. Trust in Christ now. And then you will understand that when you pray to God, you can have assurance that God will hear and that God will answer your prayers. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, this is an important lesson for each of us to learn, that we should never presume upon ourselves. We should never presume upon past successes of any kind for future success in the spiritual realm at all. But we must rely upon you in prayer. And so, Lord, teach us to pray. Help us to understand that we are always to be a people of prayer, that we are always to come to you and to seek your face and to seek your power and to seek your blessing through prayer in Christ. And so bless us in this. And my prayer today is for any who are of your elect, who are listening or watching, who have yet to come to Christ, that today might be the day that you would open their eyes to see and unstop their ears to hear and transplant within them a heart of faith that they might trust in Jesus and learn what it really means to be able to pray. I ask this through Christ, our Savior and our King. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week, and I look forward to bringing the Word of God again next time.